agencies, county, that uh, were searching for this baby and unfortunately were unable to bring her home alive, but did <coughs> their best to see that justice was done. Particularly Mark Russell of the Syracuse Police Department, who just did an unbelievable job. He's the, the real hero of this case. I'd like to thank uh, my opponent here, if you will, uh, Mr. Davenis. It is, it is not an easy job to represent an unpopular case. You get people ask you stupid questions like, how could you represent that guy? And so forth and so on. And Mike is a, uh, proud to call him a friend. He's a worthy adversary, but he's, he represents what I think is the best about the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. And I'd like to thank you, Your Honor. This may be the last time, in, uh, having appeared in front of you for 40 years, this may be the last time that I do appear in front of you. And as usual, you have shown your graciousness and tact with the family of this little baby, the Fosters and, and Morgan. And uh, I appreciate that, and I will miss that more than I can say. I will miss our interaction as well, so that's the only way. Thank you, Your Honor. I, uh, I'm not uh, standing here this morning to try to convince you of a, of a sentence. Uh, the sentence has been agreed to. I'm really speaking to a parole board that uh, some members may not uh, have been born yet. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lawrence will eventually appear in front of them and what they, I don't know what they'll see. They might see a very timid, meek, 49 or 50 year old man uh, who will be obviously seeking to be released. And I would, <coughs> I would beg of them, I want this to be part of his permanent record as he goes off to state prison, I would beg of those parole board members to think about the agony and the pain that this man has caused. This little baby, ironically enough, was at Sloan Kettering. At about the same time, my daughter was there. And I remember, like it was yesterday, Diane and I sitting there with our daughter who was in, the, in her 20s, but because of the nature of her illness, she was in the pediatric center in Sloan Kettering, and seeing all these families going about, knowing that you could pick one at random, and that kid's not gonna make it. But baby Maddox made it, she beat it. She was a hero. She beat the cancer, and what should have been a cause for celebration turns into this, where we are today. The person most responsible for protecting her takes her life away in this insidious manner. And I know, I know we all want to know why. Why did he do it? The fact is he did do it. And we forget there's evil in this world. And I don't think that evil can be extinguished in 25 years or 50 years. So I plead with the parole board, who I don't know, I won't, God, God only knows where I'll be in 25 years. I plead with you, don't let this man out. And now, Your Honor, I, uh, with your permission, of course, I would invite uh, Baby Maddox's uh, uncle and aunt, uh, Rich Lawrence and Nicole Lawrence, to uh, appear and address the court. I'm, uh, I'm Rich Lawrence. Good morning. Good morning. If you would speak up so everyone can hear you. Sorry. Brian, as I sat down to write this statement, I, know I had to choose my words carefully because these are the last words I'm going to speak to you. I thought I was going to tell you that the brother I once knew is dead. And what's left is a stranger and a murderer. However, I know that is not true, and deep down, it's not what I actually believe. You are a stranger, and you are a murderer. But you are also my brother. <clears throat> you didn't turn into someone else. You weren't possessed. And you weren't acting against your will. You are my brother and you are 100% responsible 
for your own actions. As it turns out, the brother I thought you were never actually existed. Beyond your facade, and you had me fooled. You only truly opened up to me twice in our lives. I don't know if you remember. Uh, once before Maddox was born, you called me from a dinner party. You were hiding in the bushes like the coward you proved yourself to be. All because you were too scared and weak to face your responsibilities. At the time, I thought I could be I I thought you could be brave and a supportive father. So I encouraged you to be that person. I told you that bravery is the act of doing the right thing, even when you're afraid to do it. I wanted you to pick yourself up and take responsibility for yourself and your family's future. The only other time you opened up to me was long before the first, during our trip to Anguilla to, to honor mom. You broke down and told me the only reason you hadn't run away since mom died was because no one in the family had given you a, a reason to. You said we were too good to you. I now realize how right you were. We never did anything but encourage you and whatever plan for your future you came up with, no matter how ridiculous it was, and you had a lot of them. This happened far too often, I encouraged you I encouraged you because I wanted you to pick a direction and stick with it. And I want you to drift around from false goal to false goal and never find happiness. When you called me to tell me Morgan was pregnant, I was so proud of you for choosing to stay in the picture. I felt that Morgan and Maddox were the future that you were looking for. I was wrong. I didn't know what was going on behind the curtain. I speak to you now as the father of a little girl. If the love of your child doesn't provide a bright enough future for you, nothing ever will. Maddox loved you. She trusted you. And she followed you into those woods. She was punished because of your weakness. You were, ne you were never a father. That title is reserved for protectors and selfless men. You are neither. You will not hear words of encouragement from me. Not anymore. You, my brother, will live the rest of your life knowing that you murdered your best shot at true happiness. choose to create it. There is strength in that. 
and strengthen something you know nothing about. As you are raised in a family of weakness, for those who continue to do what is easy and self-serving, you deserve every consequence that is handed to you. You should not be allowed to live your years in comfort with joy and love that you so brutally stole from your own child. I feel no pity for you, only disgust for all the waste you have created. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Honor. And now, uh, if I would invite up to the table uh, Baby Maddox's grandparents, Mike and Robin. Seven years I've been a wife and a stay at home mother of four daughters. I'm the mother of Morgan Lawrence. I've also had the privilege of being a grandmother for the past three and a half years. Maddox Mary Lawrence was my only granddaughter. My life was, was always revolving around my family, and I love the life that I made with my husband and my children. We have a very large, loving family and some wonderful close friends, and we always welcome new people into our family and we love them. Ryan was welcomed with open arms and loved and supported by all of us. I cared for Ryan deeply and I was praying for him regularly. He seemed genuinely loving towards Maddox and Morgan. I supported and encouraged him. And when Ryan and Maddox were missing, would please ask me my opinion of Ryan's relationship with Maddox. I was insistent that he loved and adored her and would never harm her. Everyone who's seen us together believed the same thing. The fact that he can deceive so many people proved that he should never be trusted. When I found out what Ryan did to Maddox, my whole world was turned upside down. I cannot describe the amount of grief and loss that I felt, and I'm still feeling. The feeling of being helpless was overwhelming. I didn't even know how to comfort my own daughter. I couldn't fix anything or make it better for her. I began to seriously question my judgment. How could I have been so sure about his intentions toward Maddox and be so totally wrong? What about the other judgments I've made? Were they wrong too? I felt that if I had better charge of judgment, I could have protected my daughter and my granddaughter. I began to fear that my daughter would not be able to survive this, and I experienced incredible guilt because I was visiting my other grandchildren in Connecticut during the last five days of Maddox's life. I had trouble getting out of bed most mornings. Every morning I would wake to find that this wasn't a nightmare, it was reality. I experienced anxiety when going out in public. I felt very vulnerable and avoided people that I knew. I was afraid of having to talk about it, and I was embarrassed that I was so deceived by Ryan. I wondered how the loss of Maddox and the trauma of knowing that Ryan murdered her would affect my younger children. They were 10 and 12 at the time. When issues arise in adolescence or adulthood, they missed weeks of school. They were nervous about returning. One of them had trouble being in large groups and had to be removed from some of her classes. They both lost interest in their hobbies and their extra activities. And I worried about my oldest daughter, who is the mother of two and lives in another state. I was wondering how she was gonna cope with this. So I started working to get away from home. I couldn't face being in the empty house where I used to care for Maddox. But even at work, I have to face my grief. I met many grandparents who want to talk about their grandchildren. I would like to talk about my grandchildren also, but I can't mention Maddox because it's too painful to talk about her to strangers. What do I say? Should I talk about her in the past tense? Will they ask me what happened? And some people have actually asked me what happened. I will simply, I mean, am I gonna just come undone? I have never been afraid to talk to people about anything, but now I am. I often find myself choosing my words very carefully. Nine months have passed since Maddox was murdered. Some things have improved, but most of my initial feelings are the same. Sometimes I have trouble concentrating because she's always on my mind. I miss her so much, and I wonder how I'm ever going to trust anyone who's going to come into this family in the future. I don't ever fully enjoy my family because I'm always aware that Maddox's presence is missing. And I know my life will never be complete again. Maddox has never left my mind, but I 
and I will never forget her voice, her smile, her laugh, her funny expressions, her incredible dance moves, her gentle touch, her soft kisses, or her whole heart and hearts. There are no words to describe how much I miss her. Max was a beautiful little girl with a big personality. She was bright, funny, friendly, and energetic. She had a quality that I just can't put into words. People were drawn to her. She was so gentle that even my old cat loved to be near her and let her pet him. She had different dance moves for every genre of music. She was full of life that even cancer couldn't keep her down. Her whole life was ahead of her, and Brian robbed her of it. The audacity of Brian Morris to take away the life of the very child that God entrusted him to care for and protect is unfathomable. Among the marital property that he requested in the divorce proceeding between Morgan and himself was a cracked fish tank, a bike with no wheels, and a picture of his dog. <laughs> These are the things of value and importance to him. Was Maddox ever important to you? I will never understand why. I know that nothing can bring Maddox back to us or make things better for Morgan. I only ask that Ryan Lawrence be punished to the fullest of the law for the horrific crime he committed against his own daughter and the effect that it has left on Morgan. <coughs> a person who is deceitful and careless should never be allowed into society, thus they have the opportunity to harm anyone ever again. every time I think of her situation. It is so unfair that my daughter had to experience this tragedy, let alone live the rest of her life with this sad reality. I wish somehow I could have protected her from this loss, but I could not. There is an evil in this world, and we never know when it's going to cross our path. I am also deeply saddened grandfather of Maddox Lawrence. I miss her every day as I wake up, reminded of what Ryan Lawrence has done. I truly wish these events had never happened. I wish somehow I could erase them. I wish Maddox was with us. February of 2016, I spent what would be the final weekend of my granddaughter's life with her, her parents, my wife and daughters, Gabrielle and Olivia, and my oldest, at my oldest daughter's house, Ashley in Connecticut, with her, her husband David, and their two sons, Zachary and Aiden. We had what seemed like a wonderful time. Everybody seemed to enjoy themselves, including Ryan. I remember commenting to my wife how special this weekend was to have all of our children and grandchildren together under one roof. It was enjoyable to see our grandchildren playing together. Robin spoke about plans she had for their futures, about things she wanted to experience as our grandchildren grew up, and about how great it will be to see their lives unfold. As the weekend ended, Morgan, Ryan, and Maddox had to return home while me and my wife stayed in Connecticut with our children for the week. At the end of the week, during our ride home, my wife and I talked. Morgan was starting her new job Monday morning. And weeks before, I had um, spent the day with Ryan in Rochester, just the two of us. On the ride to Rochester, Ryan explained how he felt it was a waste of time to find a new job with more hours. He reasoned that at his current pay rate, more hours didn't actually equate to a lot more money for his family. 
he also stated that it would mean more time away from Maddox and that he wasn't willing to give up his time with her. I felt from this conversation that Ryan had a deep love for his daughter and that he cherished his time with her. So in response, I agreed with him. I felt that he should spend the time with Maddox and not chase after a few extra dollars. I believed that my daughter, her husband, and Maddox were on a good course. I also believed that Ryan truly loved them, his wife and his daughter. I was completely wrong and completely deceived. Ryan cared nothing for his wife and even less for his daughter. Maddox was a beautiful little girl. She had such a great personality. She had the ability to make you feel better just by being near you. Her presence was awesome. If she entered a room, you knew she was there and that she was special. There was something about her that I just can't explain in words. But if you knew her, you would understand exactly what I'm talking about. The baby spent a lot of time with my wife, me, and our daughters, Gabrielle and Olivia. I was sure that we would be asking to have Maddox spend the night this weekend so that we could love on her a little bit. Though shortly after returning from Connecticut on February 20th, 2016, I received a distressed call from my daughter Morgan. There was no explanation given to me for the call. There was only a request for my presence. Dad, I need you to come to my house right now. Morgan explained. I confirmed that I was on my way and I went immediately to help my daughter. Arriving at her apartment, I entered to see my daughter totally stressed out and a police officer speaking to her. Our lives were instantly turned upside down. Ryan was gone and we had no way to contact him. He left the impression that Maddox would be gone as well and that Morgan most likely would never see her again. Our nightmare had started. We sat together waiting and wondering where Maddox was and how Ryan could do this. Hour after hour, we just waited, continually answering questions from police while Morgan replayed the events of the night to each new officer she met. Waiting with Morgan and seeing her grief was gut-wrenching. The thoughts that ran through my mind were stifling. Thoughts of my defenseless granddaughter, this beautiful 21-month-old baby, who was now in an unfamiliar place. I had questions. Was she with strangers? How was she being treated? Was she safe? How scared was she? And then I just wanted her back in my arms. I wanted her reunited with her mother. I wanted her to feel safe and loved again. I wanted her home. I was confused and scared that I might never see my granddaughter again. Morgan, Nikki, and I waited Saturday night into Sunday morning together in Morgan's apartment, waiting and waiting for some answers, anticipating news that they found Maddox and that she is safe. However, our anticipation often gave way to uncomfortable silence while we sat there receiving no answers. This caused us to discuss many different scenarios of what could have happened and where they might be. We started to speak of hope. We started to trust that we would see her again. We started to believe that Maddox and Ryan would be found, still having no idea what to expect. This roller coaster ride of emotions was somehow debil debilitating. We couldn't sleep, we couldn't eat. We desired nothing other than Maddox back in Morgan's arms. Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, my daughter Morgan, my wife Robin and I spent most of our time at the public safety building. We spoke with detectives and other law enforcement personnel. Morgan was re uh, replaying the events over and over as she answered questions for the authorities. We still didn't know what to expect. We just waited together, supporting each other. We hoped each time a detective entered the room, we would receive the news that they found Maddox and she was fine. However, visit after visit only produced more questions, no answers. Then, sometime on Monday, we received news that Ryan was found and in custody. Our hope immediately rose up. Where's the baby? Morgan asked. 
Our hope was immediately stifled. They didn't have Maddox, only Ryan. Panic set through our minds. Where is she? Is she okay? Does someone have her? Is she alone? It was February. The high temperature that day was 30 degrees. The low was 15 degrees. We feared she might be alone. Ryan, they said, smelled of smoke like a campfire. We worried Maddox could be outside still or somewhere without a heat source. We just wanted her to be found. We couldn't wait to see her and hug her again. I thought it can't be long now until we are reunited. This poor baby, who knows what she's been through. And then we received the worst news we have ever heard in our entire lives. Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016, Ryan Lawrence admitted to killing his baby girl. I cannot fathom how a father is able to take the life of their own child. The killing of Maddox totally infuriates me, completely disgusts me, and ultimately saddens me. But it has also created in me an overwhelming feeling of loss. Before Maddox was murdered, on my days off, Morgan would drop her daughter off for the day. My daughter would announce when she saw me, hey, look, Max, look who it is. It's your best friend. I would feel so honored. I wasn't just grandpa. I was Maddox's best friend. I would lay with Maddox while we watched episodes of Sophia the First. Then we would play. Tea Party was one of her favorite things to do. She loved this American Girl doll table, chairs, and tea set. She would actually sit on the small chair and play with the cups on the table. And then we would just do whatever Maddox wanted. Of course, I would tickle her every chance I got. Her laugh was so hearty, her smile so big. She would look at me with her brown eyes and melt my heart. I miss those days. I feel robbed. As if much was stolen from me. And it was. I was unable to celebrate her second birthday with her and watch her blow up the candles on her cake. I missed out on seeing her opening her gifts. This summer, Maddox didn't float around with me in my pool as I expected she would. She doesn't spend the night anymore. And I no longer watch Sophia the First. I can't take her for an ice cream cone or push her on a swing. I didn't see her reaction to the beautiful fireworks and the loud explosions on the 4th of July. We didn't attend the New York State Fair together, see the butter sculpture, or drink cups of chocolate milk. I missed her as we went apple picking. I didn't see her in her Halloween costume. I won't be able to rake the leaves and see Maddox jump in them and throw them up in the air. She won't be with me for Thanksgiving dinner, nor will I have a picture of her sitting on Santa's lap this year. I won't see her learn to sled or even see her reaction to snow. She will not help us pick out a Christmas tree or decorate it with us. I won't see her come to my house on Christmas Day excited to see the gifts under the tree. I won't see her <coughs> tie her own shoes or hear her tell me she is a big girl because she uses the potty. I will miss out on her attending preschool. I won't be able to take her picture on the steps of the school bus on her first day of kindergarten. I won't hear her recite the alphabet or count to 100. Her special drawings won't hang in my house. 
I will never see her sing in a chorus, star in a school play, or learn how to play an instrument. I won't see her learn how to ride a bike, jump rope, or even swim. She will never show me her first loose tooth, nor will she bring it to me when it finally falls out. I will never see her first haircut or her hair grow to reach her shoulders. I won't hear her tell the story of how she caught her first fish or how she climbed her first mountain. All of this, I feel, has been stolen from me. I also feel that my future has been torn from me. I will never be part of the life that Maddox should have been allowed to experience. Like seeing her attend her first school dance or hearing about her first kiss, congratulating her for getting her driver's permit or watching her get ready for her junior prom, taking pictures of her and her date before her senior ball, or letting her drive my car when she receives her driver's license. I will never hear Maddox's name being called at her high school graduation. And I won't see her walk across the stage to receive her diploma in the class of 2032. I won't hear about the choice she has made of where to attend college, nor will I help her move into her dorm her freshman year. I will not hear that she has met the man of her dreams or see her graduate from college. I won't witness her wedding proposal or see her fitted with a perfect wedding dress. Never will I hear that Maddox said I do, and never will I see a wedding ring placed on her finger. I won't hear the wonderful news that Maddox is pregnant, nor visit her after she gives birth. I will never have the opportunity to hold her baby in my arms. But that is not all. Every second, minute, hour, day, month, and year of her future was taken from me. Actually, what was stolen from me was all of her life experiences to come. How unfair of a decision Ryan solely made for innocent addicts, as well as for all of us. I cannot express enough how unfair it was that he chose to change Morgan's life. And I cannot express enough how unfair it was that Ryan chose to negatively affect so many other people's lives, including mine. So I feel it is only fair that all of Ryan's remaining seconds, minutes, hours, months, and years on this earth be somewhat taken from him. That all of his future life experiences happen while behind bars in prison. That is why I expect this sentence, 25 years to life, to actually be a life sentence. A sentence that never allows him parole. A sentence that never gives him freedom. A sentence that strips him from life itself, so to speak. So that Ryan never camps out under the stars or waits to see a beautiful sunrise, so that he never experiences the rush of riding a longboard or the thrill of mountain biking the trails, so that he never steps foot on a beach to be able to look out over the massive ocean or ever reach a mountaintop to be able to look out for miles over the trees, rivers, and lakes. A sentence that allows him a meager existence absent joy of life's experiences, a sentence with time served that will be fulfilled the day Ryan Lawrence dies behind bars. Nothing will bring back my granddaughter, and 
nothing will satisfy my overwhelming feeling of loss. I have missed her presence every second, every minute, every hour, every day, and every month since Ryan killed her. And I will miss her presence every moment for the rest of my life. That will be my prison, thanks to Ryan Lawrence. I will have to experience life now incompletely. For every positive memory to come, the despairing thought that Maddox should have been here will accompany it. For every moment I share with my other grandchildren, the overwhelming sadness, sadness of feeling that Maddox should be here will accompany those moments. For every milestone of their lives that I experience, I will have missed out on a milestone of Maddox's life that she should have had the right to experience. But now she doesn't, because Ryan Lawrence decided to make a final decision for her and everyone involved. Her life was ended for reasons I will never understand, nor do I want to. Instead, I will celebrate my granddaughter by remembering her. I will cherish the time I had, short as it may have been. I will treasure the moments she spent with me and know that in these short 21 months that Maddox has managed to imprint herself upon me, I love my granddaughter with all of my heart. She will never be forgotten. against my will out of motherhood. I've been robbed of my livelihood and my most valuable possession. I'm uncomfortable conversing with others about my quick experiences due to the past few years revolving around providing the best life I could for Ryan and Maddox. I've lost my home. I've lost my job. I've lost many people I consider family. And I'm talking about your family because of your actions. suffering from anxiety and depression because of losing Max and all the drastic changes I'm facing, such as my housing situation. Ryan Lawrence's actions have left me unbearably heartbroken. I'm dumbfounded by the audacity of his <laughs> to make such an uneducated decision on behalf of everyone in Maddox's life. Any one of our family members or friends would have gladly taken her from you if you had just told her that you were feeling you were going to harm her. Extreme loneliness and sadness. 
The situation also leaves me questioning my own judgment of others' intentions and their character. Burying my daughter alone was the single most howling experience I've ever endured. Knowing that her death was at the hands of a man that I once loved and trusted with our lives shakes me to the core because of what Ryan has done. I can never again be sure that I know someone for who they truly are. Ryan Lawrence's actions have affected the lives of others as well. Maddox was loved by everyone she met. She was strong and inspiring. She's missed greatly by everyone who knew her. And those who are very close to her, such as our family, are heartbroken and outraged. Three of Maddox's aunts are my own sisters. Two of them spent nearly every day with her. And they're both under the age of 13. They're children. They should have never been suspected of this type of person. And heart and violence. The situation wears on them during everyday life, ranging from personal pain to comments other children make at school about me. They didn't choose to be plastered all over the news and the internet. This is exposure that our family didn't ask for and more watch. My other sister has grown with two children of her own and one on the way. As she watches her children grow, she wonders the same things I do. Her children have as close of a bond as they do. Who would manage to grow to be? She looked like what would her talents have been. She mourns, as I do, for her children, who are too young now to understand. But will someday have questions about Maddox when they see her pictured in photographs beside them. At that point, like others in our family, we're small children. She'll have to decide how to jump that touchy hurdle. Does she choose to share stories or withhold? These are challenging situations we must decision, challenging decisions we must all make. Some of the most effective people, aside from myself, in this situation are Ryan's brother, Richie, and his wife Nicole, and their young daughter Chloe. Two years. For them, standing by me means losing their family members. Top of the double loss we are facing by losing Maddox and Ryan. Ryan's actions have torn his whole family apart as they argue over supporting for myself through this situation. Finally, the local community has been greatly shaken by Ryan's actions. They've done everything in their power in searching for Maddox while she was missing to building memorials and helping me rebuild my life. Ryan Lawrence's actions have affected my financial situation as well. I now find it really difficult to hold a job, making providing the necessities for myself near impossible. I, I can't afford to live on my own, but I find it very difficult to live with others during this trying time. Since February, the police have withheld my vehicle, laptop, my DSLR camera that Ryan had used during his crime. This has hindered me from being able to work as a photographer, causing larger graft and income and adding emotional strain on me since I use art as a form of de stress. Ryan's actions have also affected my social interactions with old friends, new friends, and even strangers. I'm constantly trying to mention, I'm constantly trying to avoid the mention of Ryan when speaking with old friends. However, almost always, that's where the conversation ends up going. While talking to new friends I've met recently after the situation, I'm always questioning if they recognize me. I'm always feeling as if I am 
Interactions with strangers are most uncomfortable. Often people stare at me as if they recognize me. Several people have approached me, claiming they know me, but they can't place me. I wait patiently while they try to place me, denying all their guesses. I know how they recognize me. They've seen my face on the internet or Nancy Grace. They've heard my voice on the radio. First saw me on TV, begging Ryan to bring medics home to save to me. But I'll never tell them. I want to be myself again, just to be Morgan. I don't want to be identified by Ryan's horrible actions. And I don't want Maddox's life to be identified, like, to be known by her, by her death. Like, I want her to be known for who she was, and I want to be known for the loving mom and wife that I truly was. As a result of Ryan's actions, I, I need for him to spend the rest of his lifetime in prison. I fear for my safety, and I fear for the safety of safety of others through his back into the community. He's deceived everyone in his life with ease. And he's betrayed all of us with his actions. He's charismatic and believable when he wants to manipulate a situation in his favor. Before a girl boy, girl for 25 years from now, he may seem remorseful. He may beg and plead to be released. He may claim to be changed. Please don't be fooled. He's a monster. And I truly do believe he'll kill a guy if given the chance. Don't give him that chance. This is the most horrible thing I've ever endured in my life. But I want you to know, you will not drag me down. I will rise above this and honor my daughter with my own life. You took Maddox's only chance at life, Ryan. Therefore, you don't deserve another chance at your own. responsibility for his acts, and I can tell you his overwhelming shame and remorsefulness for what he did. I think that's best highlighted in Dr. Knowles' report that the court has, where he stated that he showed a close proof of remorsefulness for his conduct and got appropriately emotional when he discussed the details of the offense. And the 
Garcia report echoes that. It states that I am full of remorse, regret, shame, and unimaginable grief and recognize that we have to be rational. Fourth, I ask the court to consider that by all accounts, prior to this unthinkable and incomprehensible crime, Brian was a dutiful, loving, and completely responsible father to his daughter. It's confirmed by many people who have heard from, including those of whom have provided letters to the court for reconsideration, including his father, sister, neighbor, friends, and a former employee, Mr. Dobbs, who was the co-owner of Freedom of Espresso in Syracuse. And I think it's worth knowing his quote, the person who actually employed Morgan first and then Ryan as a delivery man, where he states that not only was Ryan conscientious and courteous, but what stood out was the beautiful love and care he showed Maddox at all times. He never showed impatience, irritation, or any kind of discomfort in his interaction with Maddox. Not only would I see it, but many of my early coffer customers remarked on it. He concludes that Ryan was thought of prior to this incident as a wonderful example of a young father in a loving relationship with his da daughter. Brian's parenting included taking Maddox to cancer treatments in New York City and caring for at times when he was home alone and when his mother was present and when he was at work. I think the best way to capture that love is demonstrated anecdotally in the email that he provided to the court that Ryan wrote a few months before this horrible incident occurred for anticipation of his father babysitting Maddox. He sat to work in detail after detail from morning, noon, and night what he thought his father should do to properly care for Maddox. Just one real quick excerpt of that is what he said about bedtime. A short temper, pigeon toes, and rubbing her eyes are dead giveaways that she's ready. Bedtime can be as early as eight o'clock she loves books, but will really, rarely she read one to its entirety. Give her a warm bottle, six to seven ounces to satisfy with a touch of honey. And that details that throughout. And I think that email details, Your Honor, what is so utterly perplexing to me in so many levels of this case, because it seems incomprehensible that this tragic act could come from a father <coughs> who showed that kind of care prior to this incident. This is why lastly, I want to make it absolutely clear that with respect to this tragic, unexplainable event, I don't think I would be complete in fulfilling my duties as his attorney if I, ignore, if I ignore referring you to those factors that are set forth in Dr. Horowitz's report that you have. He indicates or upon Ryan's emotional state, which may have contributed to him committing these acts and the flawed thinking that allowed him to believe that somehow, some way, by keeping committing this inexplicable act it was the best option for his daughter and his wife. I don't want to preface that by saying we don't refer the court to that to in any way use it as an excuse for his act or to place blame on anyone. It simply show possible factors that affected his state of mind. Dr. Horowitz notes that there were some problems that Ryan incurred growing up that are detailed in that report may have led him to project his unhappiness as a child upon his daughters, and may have allowed him to overvalue that child's anticipated or perceived unhappiness that led him to this flawed and unbelievable thinking that by doing this act, he was somehow helping her. That predisposition and those factors may have led him to that. He knows that thinking now is terribly wrong. The crime was clearly an aberration of Ryan's character prior to this incident, as I understand it. In any case, Your Honor, please note that Ryan realizes the thinking that led him to do this to Maddox was completely wrong. He is devastated by the tragedy and pain caused to everyone involved, and especially to Maddox. He apologizes for that and will live with this shame and sadness and pain every day for the rest of his life knowing what he caused in the loss of his daughter. Unfortunately, he cannot take back what he did by his plea. He can only hope he has done something to help at least put some limited closure to this horrific 
of that and accept the agreed upon punishment. Based upon the foregoing and our submissions in Dr. Willis' report, it's respectfully requested that we made it a permanent record and that by lying statements, it's clear he accepts responsibility and is remorseful for what he did and request that the court impose the agreed upon sentence and that upon his incarceration be considered for the ADP program. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Van Heek. And Mr. Lawrence, is there anything you'd like to say on your own behalf? It's incredibly hard to talk about this for many reasons, and even harder to find the words to explain such a horrible crime. It's with all of my heart that I convey my sincerest apology to everyone for taking Maddox from her family and everyone who loved her. I'm also utterly sorry for denying Maddox her chance at life. I can't expect your forgiveness, but I tell you now that the sorrow I feel for what I've done is complete and comes from the deepest depths of my being. This sorrow I feel has nothing to do with being in jail, but for the pain for the loss of Maddox. I miss her so bad. Max is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'd say that to her all the time and to anyone else who'd listen. It was amazing to have her everywhere I went, including all the times I brought her to work with me. When our baby was diagnosed with cancer, we were in shock, but hopeful that the doctors in New York City would cure her, as indeed they did. Even after enduring countless overnight trips to the hospital and fruitless attempts at soothing a baby who couldn't possibly understand why she couldn't eat for hours before invasive treatment procedures, the threat of her cancer returning was very real. Our work schedules were arranged so that one of us was always with the baby, but there was very little time for the three of us together, nor enough money for a sitter or much of anything else. Still, we treated her and fed her better than we did ourselves and loved her far more than anything else we've ever known. In no way can I justify my actions and there is no one to blame but myself. There is no good explanation for such a horrendous crime and regret is too simple a term to describe what I feel. What I can say is I've never felt such strong emotions towards anything in my life than my ever-growing and unconditional love for Maddox and now I'm completely distraught by overwhelming grief and anguish for what I've done. I was never jealous of my daughter. Both our families know I love Maddox. If anything, I only wanted more for her. Max was always at the top of my list and is constantly, to this day, the focal point of my thoughts and actions since she first came into my life. I'll never overcome this feeling of loss, but I will spend the rest of my life trying to figure out how I got to such a dark, irrational state. She was my life's purpose and making her happy was my job. Such strong feelings of love, however, brought equally strong feelings of fear and uncertainty when it came to my responsibility for her happiness. Although I blame no one else for my acts, as the pressures to save, to give her the perfect life built up, I also struggled against relentless waves of negative emotions every day, bearing witness to the pain and sadness in many of my wife and daughter's interactions. Yet no reason and no psychological diagnosis seemed plausible to me to have made me commit this act against my very nature, taking the one thing I love most. This Easter, my father, weeping, asked me what I was thinking. In despair, I gave him the only answer I could. I don't know. Although these pressures led me to this unthinkable act, I cannot now make sense of what I did. There's no, right, there's no valid reason for why our daughter Maddox had to die. Not a second goes by when I don't wish I could take back what I did and that Maddox would still be alive. I pray all the time that she's in a better place and that God and my mother are watching over her. 
Morgan and all of those who loved her. I hope that from my plea and acceptance of responsibility, you can find at least some measure of closure from the pain I inflicted. This was and is, without question, the worst act I will ever commit. I recognize that no one but myself can be blamed for this atrocity and I will always be traumatized knowing I'm responsible for such incomprehensible actions. Although I accept this punishment, nothing can be worse. Nothing can be worse than my own despair at the loss of Ned, and I regret that I'm not alone in that feeling. I love my daughter with all my heart. <laughs> the only thing that can match my love and loss of her now is the dreadful pain and remorse I feel for committing such a terribly terrible crime. I'm sorry. I know I can never be sorry enough. Part of this uh, agreement uh, was and is, uh, Mr. Lawrence, that uh, you waive your right to appeal. You have done that formally at the time that uh, you went to plead the guilty to the first and the third count of this indictment. And again, I want to reiterate for the record, you understand that in addition to the rights that you have waived when you entered your plea to guilty in this case, there were there are additional rights that you can assert on an appeal. And you are hereby waiving the assertion of those additional rights upon an appeal. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Do you hereby waive your right to appeal? Yes, sir. It's very difficult for this court or for any court to make remarks following such sensitive and emotional and caring and loving remarks uh, made by the family. I thought about the remarks that today and I, I will certainly modify them in light of what I've heard today. I could not say or express the feelings any better than family members have thought so here in this morning. But baby Maddox, Maddox Law, deserves to rest in peace. Deserves a quiet and true and final resting peace without any possibility of uh, appellate decisions that may disturb the, that peace several years from now. It was very important, I believe, uh, to the Maddox family, and the Lawrence family, excuse me. They wanted this horrific and tragic case to be resolved with finality, injustice, the overriding element of this entire matter is the seeking of justice for Maddox Law. Without the prospect of a long and painful trial, and, and certainly without the prospect of several years of appeal. It would only after be it would only have come after a lengthy trial and if a conviction was had where this court would have the discretion to impose life imprisonment without parole. I believe that you deserve such a sentence. But we have made this agreement in light of all the totality of the facts and circumstances in this case and everyone's desire that Maddox Lorne, baby Maddox, would rest in peace, finally. And certainly, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick and his office and this court and Mr. Babinese understands that this court has rendered several <coughs> complex and disti distinct decisions along the progress of this trial. Now, I certainly stand on those decisions. I believe that they were right and correct. One of the decisions was the cornerstone of this prosecution, that this case was, in fact, a murder in the first degree. The intentional killing of someone, Maddox Lawrence, 
in the course of a kidnapping. I believe that the prosecution was correct, and I made a decision accordingly. And there were additional decisions that were made uh, as a result of the very uh, professional motions made by Mr. Babinies in this case, as they related to the, the very admissibility of Ryan Lawrence's confession in light of allegations that they were taken in violation of his right to counsel. I firmly believe that, that those statements and that confession and admission were not taken in violation of Mr. Lawrence's right to counsel, and the court made its decision accordingly. But again, neither the people nor the defense of this court are unmindful that anything, anything can happen on an appeal. That's why I want to reemphasize this morning that Ryan Warren has waived any and all right to appeal. And it is all of our belief in the depths of our hearts that Maddox Lawrence will rest in peace. This agreement in sentence gives Maddox Lawrence a final resting place. She will rest in peace. And obviously her, her feelings of love from the family will live on forever. And again, I don't pretend to uh, be able to express the feelings that I have about this case and about Maddox Lawrence any better than what we have just heard in this call. And I can say to the family that I appreciate those remarks and I understand how hard it is to come into this open court to make those remarks. The legal issues surrounding this tragic death will be laid to rest today. Ryan Lawrence, you took the this bright, spirited, beautiful, innocent child. Of her family and her friends. Children are not supposed to die before their parents. This is, this is not the natural course of events uh, in our lives that we expect. And in this case, for what purpose? I read all the reports that have been submitted to the court and letters and all of that. But the overriding question. What was the purpose? What was the purpose in taking this beautiful child to life? There is no. There is no. There is really no closure when you lose a child. And when thinking of my sentencing remarks today, in this case, I recall two other tragic cases that uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick prosecuted in this very courtroom in front of this judge. Unfortunately, there were many more during the course of my career that I will not mention. But two of them do stand out. One was Regina Reynolds. It was a cold case file that uh, the DA's office uh, prosecuted several years ago. And at, the, at that time, it was uh, over 25 years old. Regina Reynolds' body was found on the shores of Atisla Lake, and uh, 
to the tenaciousness of the police and uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick's office, that case uh, came to trial and, and was resolved. I believe uh, a few years ago, the defendant in that case that I sentenced to 25 to life died in prison. There was another case that certainly touched uh, my heart. It was a Jenny, Jenny Lynn Watson case. I call her this community's adopted ballerina. She too was murdered for no real reason. And as, they, as we see here today, the families uh, that have, members that have spoken, and, and I'm sure there's other family members out there with the same feelings and, and friends. Uh, it is clear that this family believes in, in, in life, they believe in love. They believe in the over overriding principle of trust and faith. You all will survive. You will survive. You will carry on. You will carry on for Maddox Lawrence memory. Your hearts are forever broken. And I understand there is no real closure when you lose a child. And again, in thinking of the remarks that I am making and what remarks I have made previously, in this case, and I'm sure Mr. Fitzpatrick recall caused these remarks in, in that other case, I came across a very unlikely quote regarding the loss of a child. These will probably be one of the last <coughs> remarks that I will make as a judge in a case like this. That quote goes like this. A wife who loses a husband is called a widow. A husband who loses a wife is called a, a widow. And a child who loses his parents is called an orphan. You know, Mr. Lawrence, there is there is no term. There is no term. For a parent who loses a child. That's how awful it is. I say that to you, uh, Say this to you, and in order to you, to, in order to describe to everyone, in some small way, the scope and breadth and devastating result of your callous and selfish and horrific acts in taking Maddox's life. You had no right. You had no right to decide when she should die. But what you did not kill that day. could not be killed. What you did not kill was the love in the hearts of so many relatives and friends. That love in their heart, their hearts will live, live forever. Maddox Lawrence, uh, baby Maddox is 
as she has been commonly referred to, became what I call a hero in this community. The pain and suffering you cause transcends the tragedy of Maddox's death and has truly touched the hearts and minds and the very soul of so many people in this community. This community has truly felt a personal sense of loss by her death. I cannot describe that loss in words. You didn't know her, but you felt that you did. Mr. Lawrence, based upon the totality of the facts and circumstances of this case, it's my opinion you deserve to spend the rest of your life in prison for what you have done. I may not be around in 25 years from now. And if I am, I will be asked for my opinion. And I will get it in terms of your parole. However, if I'm not, my words are in this record and my expressed opinions regarding your punishment will live on. It is a sentence and judgment of this court that based upon your plea of guilty, the murder in the first degree, discharged in the first count of this indictment, that you be sentenced to the maximum sentence of life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. Relative to your plea of guilty, the murder in the second degree is charged in the third count of this indictment. It is a sentence and judgment of this court to receive the maximum sentence of life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. By law, these sentences uh, must run concurrently with each other. Surcharge? $325 mandatory surcharge and a $50 gaming fee. Great. And, uh, and for the record, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, uh, Mr. Kelly. I've said this before about the both of you, but it does, deserves repeating. And both of you have lived up to the highest standard that I can expect from prosecutors in this community. And I appreciate it. And Mr. Babanese, you have fought hard in this case. You have fought as professionally as any lawyer that I have had come before you. your professionalism in this matter. 